Good afternoon, and welcome to our Plus You conversation with Mark Zandi, Chief Economist of Moody's Analytics. I'm Jonathan Reckford, CEO of Habitat for Humanity International. Mark, we are delighted to have you with us. Thanks for joining us today. Jonathan, it's really great to be with you. Thanks for the opportunity. I want to point you to Mark's uh, biography, incredibly impressive bio in the uh, chat where you can see the detail, but he is a frequently sought after speaker expert on all things economic. And we're so pleased to talk today about how housing fits into the broader economic picture and particularly what that means in terms of the opportunities and challenges of providing affordable home ownership to more families. Mark, uh, the economy has been in the news in a huge way. Maybe we could just start, today was a big announcement. Uh, could you give us your sense of where the economy is heading right now, and then particularly your view of the housing market, given the sharp increase in interest rates in the last few months? Sure, Jonathan. Well, the economy is struggling. Uh, growth is uh, slowing. Uh, and, you know, at, at, at root, the problem we're uh, grappling with is uh, two massive shocks to the economy, That's what economists call supply shocks to the supply side of the economy, the first being the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and, you know, that's becoming less of an issue, but still an issue. I mean, the Chinese uh, uh, continue to shut down their economy every time a wave of the virus uh, passes through, and that's highly disruptive to global supply chains and comes back, affects us through higher prices for everything from vehicles to consumer electronics. And the, and the pandemic uh, is still affecting our labor markets, our job markets. We have many people that are uh, having trouble with long COVID or not working because they're taking care of elderly parents or they're worried about their uh, their children who are unvaccinated. So that's one uh, massive shock. The other is the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which you know wasn't even on the radar screen a year ago. And that really has done a lot of damage, uh, primarily through higher oil and agricultural prices. In fact, if you go back uh, a month ago, well, at this point, maybe two months ago, we were paying five dollars for a gallon of regular unleaded. I, you may, I don't know what you're paying in Atlanta, but that was kind of the average price across uh, the United States. That was a record high. That was a record high, and nothing stings more financially to American households, particularly lower uh, income households, than having to pay more at the gas pump. And food prices, you know, food prices have just gone skyward, and in, in part because of the higher cost of diesel. You know, the one of the biggest parts of food prices is just transporting the food from the farm to the store shelf. So we've been grappling with these two shocks. It's slowed growth. It's raised inflation and to the point where the Federal Reserve Board has gone on high alert saying, hey, you know, we got to get this inflation in. We've got to, you know, make sure that we quell these inflationary pressures. So they've been raising interest rates. And, uh, you know, there's no more rate sensitive sector of the economy than housing, right? Because if you want to, most for most people, if you want to go buy a home, you need a mortgage, and that is critically the cost of that mortgage. Your monthly payment is critically dependent on uh, the mortgage rate, and so housing is incredibly interest rate sensitive. So the economy is struggling, and housing is getting nailed uh, because you know it is the most rate sensitive sector. The housing demand, home sales are way off, home building is softened, and even house price growth is. Kind of starting to take it on the chin, and so uh, you know we're the economy feels very fragile. I will say, uh, you know, uh, I want to end on a dark note, <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll end on a more slightly more positive note. We've gotten some better economic data recently. I don't know if you saw today, Jonathan. The uh, data for consumer price inflation came out for the month of July. Inflation is still really high, painfully high. But it is, it you know, it is coming in. Oil prices have come down since their peak back in June. Uh, we're now paying nationwide four dollars for a gallon of regular unleaded. Still, you know, pretty high, but you know, a lot lower than you know five bucks a gallon. Uh, we're seeing uh, the supply chain issues start to iron themselves out a bit. So, you know, ve used vehicle prices came down. Uh, so we are starting to feel things are starting to feel a little bit better. We seem to be moving in the right direction, and hopefully that convinces the Federal Reserve that uh, you know they'll raise rates some more here, but that they don't have to raise step on the brakes even harder. And that raises the odds that we can kind of navigate through this period. Uh, you know, it's going to be painful. It is painful, but we don't go into a recession, which would be something, you know, meaningfully worse than what we're suffering right now. No, so helpful, Mark. Thank you. Let's, I want to drill a little yeah. deeper with the housing piece. So we were talking about a little bit before. It's complicated. On the one hand, um, 
most people would say the housing market was overheated here in the U.S. and around the world. So you had so much money pouring in that housing prices and rents were were jumping so much faster uh, than wages, and that's that wasn't sustainable. Now hard break on the housing on the one hand. On the other hand, there's still a huge gap between what a low or moderate income family can afford and where the rents and, and mortgage payments are. As you rightly said, now uh, that starter home mortgage payments gone up by seven, several hundred dollars a month uh, with higher rates. How do you balance all those pieces? And and do you see, you know, net, if you're a, if you're a family hoping to be able to purchase a home or affordably rent a home, um, is this generally good or bad news for you right now? And, and what would make it better? Well, uh, you, you're gonna have to be patient. Uh, I mean, I think what, what's, what's happened is if you just go back, uh, you know, three, six, nine months ago, beginning of the year, mortgage rates were close to record lows. I mean, uh, the pandemic hit, the economy shut down, uh, lawmakers uh, tried to support the economy with different uh, levels of fiscal support. And the Federal Reserve obviously slashed interest rates to zero, long-term interest rates declined, mortgage rates, I think, at their low back in uh, early 2021, were 2.6% for a 30-year fix. That's an all-time low. That, because there's no, there's very little limited supply of housing, we've got vacancy rates across the housing stock that are at or below record lows. There's just no, there's no vacancy. There's no stock. We don't have enough homes particularly at the affordable part of the, of the market, low mortgage rates means more demand. And if you have no supply, demand up, supply constrained, house prices go skyward. And that's what we've seen across, what we up to this point seen happen across the country. In Atlanta, even in Philly, I'm from Philly, and Philly house prices historically, you know, they barely grow at the rate of inflation. At least that's been my uh, story of my life as a homeowner in Philly. Uh, Atlanta is better, but you know, uh, you see it's stronger. But in Philly, but I'm seeing, you know, I look at my Zillow, the Zillow uh, price for my home in Philly. I can't believe it. You know, prices in Philly are going up because we have the same kind of dynamics here. So uh, then, uh, of course, uh, we have the Russian invasion. Inflation heats up, and uh, the Fed has to reverse course to try to bring in that inflation. Mortgage rates jump. We we if you go back. Now, just a few weeks ago, I think we were almost at 6% for 30-year fix. That's come in a little bit. I think we're down to five and a quarter or something. But 6%, that's a big difference from 2.6. Those That 6% now is, uh, you combine that with the now very high house prices, and the monthly payment is just unaffordable. I mean, I'll, get, I'll give you one, one, one amazing statistic. If you go back a year ago, you're the typical American household, median income buying the median priced home, 20% down payment at the prevailing mortgage rate. You probably had to shell out maybe 1,200 bucks a month, you know, uh, to uh, get that mortgage and buy that home. Now at the prevailing mortgage rate, it's probably 1,800 bucks. You know, it's a 600 buck a month difference, and you just can't afford it. So first time buyers are locked out, and trade up buyers they're locked in, right? Because <clears throat> if you're a, an existing homeowner. Mm -hmm. You have a mortgage, maybe you refi down into, say, a three and a half or four percent uh, mortgage loan. And now, you gotta go, if you want to uh, sell your home and buy another one and get another mortgage, you got to get it at five and a half percent, six percent. Your monthly payment's going to rise to a point where you're saying, I'm not going to do that. So, what has to happen now is house prices have to adjust. Uh, so, house prices are, are starting, the increases are stopping. We're starting to see some flatness in prices. They'll start to decline in some markets. And, you know, it's going to take a little bit of time because, you know, the everyone thinks their home is worth the highest Zillow price they ever saw, right? right. And the, to give that up is going to be really hard for someone to do. But they will do it eventually when they realize there's just no demand at that price. People can't afford that price. So you'll see those prices start to, you know, moderate, particularly in the markets that are most juiced in the Southeast, you know, in the Carolinas, through Atlanta, down into Florida. In the Mountain West, the the Boise down to the you know Phoenix, we'll see some some price declines. The other thing that's going to happen is um, you know those we've seen some flipping coming into some of these markets. That's specul speculators, people buying. You know the i buyer would be a kind of a corporate flipper. You know coming in buying, think they can flip the home quickly, get a profit. They're they're getting wrung out, right? So that's going to come out of price as well. So yeah, I, I would you have to be patient. Prices have to come in. And the other thing is you know. Hopefully, we see more inventory for sale. I mean, right now, prices are high. 
mortgage rates are high and there's like no inventory. So you can't even find a home that you would want, you know, at these higher prices and these higher mortgage rates. So uh, it's, people are going to, buyers are going to have to be patient at this point. There's no, you know, a good, uh, it's not, this is like the absolute worst time to be buying. And you can see it in the home sales numbers are, they're down considerably. Uh, I'd love to, to follow a little deeper on that because we do think there's a huge supply problem. If we go back to 0809, um, you know, rightly, we were overbuilding, pro arguably, but then all the small builders went out of business and we really underbuilt for much of the last 12 uh, plus 14 years. And now we're seeing this, you know, uh, multiple different numbers, but a deficit of, you know, somewhere between a million and a half and three million units at the at the lower moderate end of the market. And a lot of markets that were historically affordable, um, there's there's no inventory at the sort of sub three hundred thousand dollar level now. How do you, um, in a market in an uncertain economy, what would have the most impact to growth supply? Because we still see there's a huge need to build more. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And that million and a half number, that's my number, Jonathan. Uh, it's it's actually a million six now. It's growing because the level of supply is still, you know, home building has picked up, you know, in the last few years. But we're like, you know, before this, the, the recent run up in rates, we were like at 1.6 million single multifamily starts per annum. The underlying demand, you know, extracting from the vagaries of the, the business cycle, probably 17, 175, you know, something like that. So even now, we still don't have enough, even, you know, before this dislocation in the housing market that we're suffering because of the run up in rates, we weren't, we weren't even back to where we needed to be to stabilize the vacancy rate. The vacancy rate, as I said, was a record low. It's still falling, still going down. So, you know, we need, a, we need a lot more supply and we need it coast to coast. It's not, you know, it's not a problem in one part of the, the country uh, and not in another rural, urban, exurban, East Coast, West Coast, Texas, you, Minnesota, you pick the play. You can shut your eyes, throw a dart at a map of the United States, and you'll probably land someplace where there's a, you know, housing problem. So uh, we 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 need more supply. And you know, if I were king for the day, uh, maybe I need a week. Give me a week. But you know, I need some time. Maybe maybe a couple of days. I would be focused on this. Uh, in uh, I would be focused mostly on uh, providing tax incentives to promote more uh, construction. And I, I focus on the tax incentives, not because there, there isn't a lot of room for government uh, spending to support more, more housing construction, but the tax incentives could get political support on both sides of the aisle. Maybe you get something done. And I think it will have a much bigger effect more quickly. So the most obvious things on the rental side would be LIHTC. You know, yeah. LIHTC is tried and true. It, it, it works. Uh, it, it, there are certain levers you can turn to juice it up and make it more attractive so that we could get more uh, you know, supply into the market, not next quarter, but perhaps by this time next year. New market tax credits. Like I, I'm the lead director of a CDFI headquartered in Philadelphia called the Reinvestment Fund, where actually we have an office in Atlanta. We do a lot of lending in underserved communities all throughout the Atlanta and uh, area in the Southeast. And we do affordable housing in, uh, in the Atlanta region. And you can use new market tax credits to, uh, right. you know, uh, uh, juice up affordable housing construction. And then uh, I, uh, I would throw out the uh, throw throw into the mix the neighborhood home tax credit. This is a new uh, idea that uh, actually Julia Gordon uh, uh, put forward. She's the FHA director now, where you know you try to help incent uh, renovation and remodeling of. Uh, of uh, dilapidated buildings. And right now you can't make that work given the economics. And if you give a little bit of a tax incentive, that would make the economics work. And you can get a lot more, you know, these uh, this old housing stock renovated and, and usable for people to, to, to live in. So I think that's where I would begin, Jonathan. I would really focus on that side of the equation. The other thing I'd do if I were king, I'd just throw it out and I'll stop, uh, is uh, I really would, and this is more on the administrative side, as opposed to uh, having to do something through the legal, uh, through law, through legislation, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. I, I mean, I think they they could play a, a meaningful role in developing a, a secondary market for manufactured housing. You know, yeah. uh, you know, that's a hundred thousand units a year. Uh, that could be two, three times that, right? And uh, but right now, there it's these are chattel, generally based on chattel loans. Right. The, the, there's no good financing here. The costs are high. It, it's just screaming for a secondary market. I mean, it's complex. 
because it's a depreciating asset. So it's different than a, than a house. So it's complicated, but I think we could solve that problem. Or, you know, accessory dwelling units, you know, the ADUs, another kind of really interesting small housing uh, units that uh, that uh, I think if there was a secondary market for for the for lending for that type of construction, we could, you know, help uh, support more of that as well. So uh, we can go on and on and on. In fact, the, the, the president, uh, the administration put out a really cool white paper probably two months ago now on this on what kinds of things can be done both administratively and through the legislative process to help support more affordable housing. I highly recommend that. I mean, I not all those things are going to work and not, you know, I wouldn't, uh, you know, they're not, uh, there, there's a certain rank order to them, but I, I think they're all reasonably good proposals for improving supply. Thank you, Mark. It's um, just quick notes on a couple of those comments. We certainly agree completely. And one of our federal priorities has been the Neighborhood Homes Investment Act. And for those of you who aren't familiar, Mark described it really well. This solves the math problem that in still many parts of the country, you can buy a house, um, but a house that needs a lot of work for a reasonable price. And by the time you invest in bringing it up to code, it won't appraise for what you what it costs to invest. The tax credit would actually help solve that gap. And we think that could meaningfully increase the, uh, the number of houses that get rehabbed and then sold to income qualified buyers. So we would love to see that happen. The other piece we haven't talked as much about is the local side. And I do think zoning and making it faster and easier to build, but also uh, more accessible to build, uh, it could be an important piece of it. Mark, before we started, we talked a little bit about uh, the role of, of private equity and private investors in, in market distortion. Can you share? I thought people would be interested in hearing that and how you see them um, influencing supply. Well, they're, they've become a, there's different types of investors, right? I mean, there's um, uh, what I call the flipper. Uh, the flipper is a, a, a buying uh, with the intent of selling very quickly to make a quick buck. Uh, and you have some uh, corporate entities that have become flippers, the so-called iBuyers. They haven't played as much a role in this market as they did in the market before the financial crisis. But they are, as I mentioned, playing a role in some markets. Uh, it, they, they, they're in some of the Carolina markets, uh, in Atlanta, Phoenix, uh, you know, you've seen some flipping. Uh, I don't, I think they'll get wrung out in this market. It doesn't if prices go flat to down, they 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 can't make money. They'll they'll be out of the market pretty quickly. Second is, second form of investors, what I would call mom and pop. You know, kind of not perhaps non corporate or maybe they might be corporate. They may have LLCs, but they're you know uh, five, ten, fifteen properties, that kind of thing. Uh, they you know they have always been part of the market. I think they will continue to be part of the market. I don't. And I don't think their role is going to increase in any meaningful way. They're kind of a stable investor base, you know, in in the, in the single family market. The the third is the kind of the uh, uh, the kind of the uh, Wall Street uh, financed uh, uh, buy to rent, uh, maybe build to rent uh, kind of uh, investor that really came on the scene in the wake of the financial crisis. They played an important role. They came in and scarfed up a lot of foreclosed property and, and they were key to putting a bottom in house prices back in 2011 and 2012. If they hadn't come in the market, we could have seen continued price declines and people will continue to lose equity and people might have lost homes. So they played, you know, I think, a uh, an important, valuable role in that period of time. But since then, they've been able to you know, kind of scale up their business. Uh, you know, it's a bit, they've turned this into a viable business model you know they uh, they've got they've got scale right because they've been buying in these community in certain communities in the south particularly and in the mountain west and they got they have scale economies that they can in terms of maintenance and uh, renting out properties you know they brought down their their fixed costs uh, they've developed a secondary market for the rental payments so they could you know they can now buy rent and securitize you know the rental stream and that uh, you know frees up capital so that they can go on and continue to invest. Uh, so I think is this is and the economics are incredibly compelling, right? With these kind of rent growth and house price growth and the, and their cost of capital being much lower, and they got cash compared to everybody else, all the typical home buyers. So they are here to stay. Uh, now they're going to go. They're going to be opportunistic. Like right now, they've stepped aside from the market because they sense that prices are going to weaken, like I described earlier. And they can get a better deal, you know, maybe a year from now or 18 months. So they've kind of pulled to the sideline, but they're going to come back and they're going to become a very significant part of the single family market going forward. In fact, you know, 
The multifamily market, go take a look at the multifamily market. That has been largely institutionalized, right? All that Wall Street money has come in. Big chunk of the uh, of the multifamily market is owned by these institutions. That's now what's happening to the single family market. Right. And, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, you can see pluses and minuses. Uh, but the one minus that I think is, you know, obvious and really an issue is home ownership, right? Because, you know, they're buying, they're going to own, they're going to rent. And that means that, uh, you know, the average American ho uh, homeowner or household, excuse me, is not going to be able to afford, not be able to purchase a home and they're going to be renters. And so the home ownership rate, which is going to be under a lot of pressure, even without investors, because of these affordability issues we're dealing with, because of demographic trends, uh, you know, we were going to see home ownership under pressure anyway. This is going to put a lot of pressure on home ownership going forward. And the final thing I'll say is, you know, I think most of us, you know, take as a given that home ownership is really important, right? It's uh, it's important for wealth building, particularly for low uh, middle income households. There's no other way to build wealth in many cases. It's critical to uh, uh, to uh, strong communities uh, because people have skin in the game and they want to keep their community safe and schools functioning well. And it's really important for a well-functioning macro economy to, to, to have high home ownership. So I think we all, most of us would agree on that point. And therefore, in that context, the increasing share of the housing market that is owned by institutional investors is an issue. Uh, I, I'll say one last thing and I'll stop. I do think the best way to address this issue is more supply. We need to get more supply back to where we started because we got to get that rent growth down because if you get the rent growth down, then the arithmetic for these investors doesn't look nearly as compelling you know, to them. Yeah. And so if you can get that down to the, you know, uh, no more than the overall rate of inflation, then, you know, the you, the typical American household has a fighting chance here to become a homeowner. Oh, it's such a great point. And, and for that reason, I see quite differently, you know, Bill Duran at least is growing supply, buying up all the, the yeah. uh, moderately priced homes and turning yeah. them into rental has really uh, made it almost impossible to find something you know, in, in many markets that were historically affordable, there's just no inventory below $300,000 now. And it's uh, yeah. and that's a huge challenge. I did want to know for our audience, if you have questions, this is a great time to put them in the chat and we will surface them up to Mark, um, but did want to continue on. If um, you we had talked a little about manufactured, and I do think the chat alone piece is really interesting. I, I think the branding is really bad. People have an image of, of but yeah. I'm really interested in modular. And basically, I'm interested in anything that could rapidly increase the number of houses. It seems like there's no magic bullet. But um, if you were to advise a, a mayor on what uh, what would be the, the three things that would be the, the most impactful to increase supply in uh, in her or his city, what, what advice would you give? Well, I mean, as you pointed out earlier, Jonathan, I mean, zoning, uh, exclusionary zoning and permitting is a big problem uh, in many communities. And this became really much more important during the financial crisis uh, because uh, when prices fell, property taxes got crushed and many communities across the country needed revenue. So they jacked up the permitting fees. And so the fixed costs of building have risen quite considerably over the last 15 years. And that's why builders, particularly the big publicly traded builders that now you know dominate the home building market, they are focused on the high end of the market because they can make enough of a, a price to cover their fixed cost and still get the return on equity they need to to build. But you know if you've got high fixed costs, high high permitting uh, fees, then you you know you can't build at a lower price point, cover your fixed costs, and get that return that you need to make you know make sense of it all in your in your spreadsheet. So I do think it's really important for mayors to you know, kind of focus on that issue. You know, what can we do to help uh, address this? And I and I do think it's also important. Here's one other area where the federal if I were king for the day, I might focus. You know, on the on the federal side, and this was part of uh, a piece of what the administration proposed in their white paper back a couple of months ago, which I referred to is provide carrots to local governments to change those zoning rules. So if you want transportation dollars, because we know a lot of transportation dollars are coming because of the infrastructure bill that was passed last year, you know, if you want those dollars or you, you know, you want a higher share of those dollars, 
then you you need to uh, work to reduce those restrictive zoning and and uh, and exclusionary uh, per, uh, uh, permitting uh, costs that you have. So I think that's where I would focus. I know that's really hard and difficult, and you're like, in, I'm sure you feel like you're in the political trench warfare when you're fighting those kind of battles. But at the end of the day, I think those are are really important. Uh, and then I do think, uh, you, you know, I, I uh, making it easier for um, you know, uh, kind of manufactured housing communities, ADU units, you know, those kinds of things. Focusing on how can I make it easier for that kind of supply to come into my community to help try to increase supply, slow rent growth, allow households to save you know some money so they can ultimately become uh, uh, homeowners. Oh, that's really helpful. It is. I'm just struck. You know, the math is broken right now. Historically, if you had you know a reasonable income in a community, you could purchase housing. You know, at 30 percent of that income, and today. Um, you know, a builder, we're about the friendliest builder out there. We can't build something at today's mm. costs that a family at, at 80% of median income in that community can afford at a reasonable percentage of their income. So either they're paying 50% or 60% of their income on rent or mortgage, that doesn't work, or they're living in substandard overcrowded uh, conditions, which also doesn't work. Um, hey, Jonathan, can I ask you, if you had to pick one, you're king for the day, if you had to pick one thing to improve supply, what would that be? Mm -hmm. You know, I think it would, um, I'd focus, I, I think we need all the federal pieces, but I'm less optimistic about how fast they're going to happen. Yeah. So I think if I were, uh, I would make it easier and faster to build. So if I were cities, I would allocate land. Cities have a ton of land, but mm -hmm. I would then put, um, combine that with, uh, with pushing mixed income. So lowering the barriers in communities of opportunity and continuing to invest in historically underinvested. But uh, but that way you get mixed income on both mm. ends. But it but it will require um, you know a mix of carrots and sticks. If you only put sticks in, um, mm. it reduces supply, and we need more supply. So I'm really interested in and more the carrot side right now in terms of yeah. Uh, and I do think for the builders, if making it faster and easier and, less, and more predictable to build would be hugely helpful. Mm. And then uh, and then either with help on financing or land. And I think those are the the biggest windows. But most cities own a ton of land, so if we mm -hmm. can actually get them to, that's going to be much faster than. And though I hope we can also break down the the NIMBY, um, you know, cohorts. But NIMBY is a bipartisan, uh, uh, one of the rare points of bipartisan agreement yeah. in our country. So we've got yeah, we've got some work there. Hey, yeah. um, we are rapidly running out of time, which I hate. One mm. of the audience questions was, you know, if if um, you gave us some encouraging potential news that we like your scenario of you know, correction, but not crash. You know, if if families are patient, uh, what can they expect as the housing market stabilizes and what should they be doing now to prepare if they hope to come into the market? Well, uh, I, I do a few things. One, uh, you know, obviously save uh, if you can. Uh, I know that's really tough when inflation is so high, but as inflation will come in, uh, you know, the Federal Reserve is going to make sure of that. So as inflation comes in, you know, maybe take those dollars that you were spending to pay for your your uh, your gas and your food and and other things, and just save it. Uh, you know, so here I'll give you a statistic, Jonathan. The for the typical American household, they're spending four hundred sixty dollars more a month uh, to buy the same goods and services that they were last year because of the high inflation. So if that inflation comes in, just take that do those dollars and. Keep it in the bank. Don't go out and spend it. Just keep it in the bank if you can. If you can. Uh, the, the second thing I do is work on that credit score. So you know, the credit bureaus are you know, much more forthcoming. You can go up to Equifax or TransUnion um, and uh, 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 Experian. Get get your credit score and start thinking about working on how to get that credit score up. Obviously, you want to make sure you. Keep paying regularly on your on whatever debts that you may have. Particularly your credit card debt, you don't want to accumulate credit card debt. Certainly not in this environment at, at these higher interest rates. So don't do that. Pay your credit card on time, and that is the best way to build that credit history and credit score. And and the third thing is, uh, you know, uh, start following listings. I'd be very, you know, because really at the end of the day, you want the right kind of home. You want a home, but you want the you know you want the right kind of home. And that takes work, you know. I don't think you know you got to you got to keep every single day, uh, you know, looking out for those listings and see what you know. Get a sense of the market, get a sense of the communities, 
get a sense of, you know, a value. And I think, you know, that'll serve you well. And then hopefully, you know, 6, 12, 18, 24 months down the road, we get a window here, you know, mortgage rates come back in, house prices are, you know, more flexible and you have an opportunity to, you know, become a homeowner. So we vote for the, uh, I'd vote for you for King for a day. I would, uh, we would love to have the, uh, uh, I, I'm you. voting for the optimistic scenario versus the meltdown scenario as well. Well, we are out of time, but uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, you know, it is, we long believed if you care about uh, families, health, education, income, and opportunities, you have to care about housing. But if you care about our economy and care about managing inflation, we've also got to address housing and the housing supply in this country. Oh, yeah. Mark Zandi, thank you for your time. Thank you for enlightening us. Thank you for being such a, a strong voice out in the community. It's been great to talk with you today. Yeah, thanks so much, Jonathan. It was really a pleasure, and I uh, wish you the best of luck. Thanks so much. That concludes. Uh, keep posted for more of these conversations. We will be putting this online. And thank you all for joining us today.